Hi, it's Lindley Oz. And I believe with everything that I have inside that we are seeing the formation of the one world religion being formed right now before us through the new apostolic reformation movement or the NAR. And as we know, they are combining forces with the Catholic Church, the Pope, and even involved in the government. Most of Donald Trump's religious cabinet are made up of people like Kenneth Copeland and more who are all part of this NAR movement. In this video, we're going to focus on dominionism and the rise of Christian imperialism. The information that will be shared in this video comes from the website www.discerningtheworld.com in an article by Sarah Leslie. This is something we all need to be knowledgeable of because, as I just said, this is the movement responsible for the formation of the one world religion the Bible clearly tells us about, which is a huge sign that we are approaching quickly major end times events. The one world religion is the end times church. It is a huge deal and very significant in relation to the return of Jesus Christ and the tribulation. Before we get too deep into this video, and I thought about it and wanted to add this to this documentary that I made on dominionism, there is nothing wrong with loving your country, praying for your country, being the type of person that really believes in godliness for your nation and wanting things to do with God in the government. That's not what this is about. So if you get that out of this video, then you're hearing it wrong. It has to do with these dominionists using that, and it's just one of the things that they use, to take control and to dominate and how they are trying to achieve this. And you'll understand if you look at all the points together. So it has everything to do with the deception involved in all of these things that they're using to manipulate and deceive. So if you just pick that out and hone in on that, then you're hearing this entire message wrong. You're not understanding it correctly. So wanting God more in our government than it is, for example, wanting the enemy out of our corrupted educational system and wanting to put Jesus back in it. I totally believe in that. So that's not what this is about. It's about how that is one of the many things that they're using deceptively to take dominion. And you're going to understand that. So I just felt it was important to point that out. And somewhere near the middle of this video, I break it down into 10 reasons to reject dominionism. And it's very detailed and very specific. Again, this point that is made is just one of many. And it's about how these dominionists are using this deceptively to deceive people and to manipulate and dominate and control. Okay, so I, I just felt it was important to be clear about that, there is nothing wrong with being very patriotic, and that's not what this is about. Because as you're going to see, dominionism is very unbiblical, it's evil, it is deceiving, it is heresy. You are going to see that as you listen and watch this entire documentary on dominionism. Now, the NAR, the New Apostolic Reformation, is also discussed quite a few times. Dominionism is part of that. And because it is so close to the truth, or better, because they use so much truth that is mixed in with deception, that is what is deceiving people because it sounds so good. And that's how you deceive people. You combine a whole bunch of truth and a whole bunch of goodness into the deception. But then there's also little things sewn throughout it that in actuality are big things that people miss and they're deceived by it because it sounds so wholesome, so biblical, 
and so true. So you really have to pay attention because there are things that are true that the dominionist use to deceive. So you're going to have to watch the message. I cannot even begin to tell you how important this video is because this whole NAR dominionist stuff is so, so evil. And it's definitely what I believe the Bible is talking about when it mentions in the end times, a great deception that is going to lead many people astray. Remember, it's going to be something that is really, really good. In other words, by good, not that dominionism is good, but something that sounds believable, something that sounds biblical, something that is going to really deceive the masses. And it's talking about the body of Christ being deceived. So I think it's important that we wake up and see the deception and see the truth in these things. We don't want to be led astray by things. We don't want to fall victim or fall prey to something that is evil. And so I need to point this out and to expose it so that you can at least have that opportunity to really see what's going on and to wake up to the deception and the corruption that is here right now coming against the true body of Christ on this earth. So please, please, please pray about this, watch this video, and share it with others because the Bible talks about how serious this deception is. And as Christians, we need to wake up to that. We need to expose it so that people do not lose their way with Jesus Christ. And like I just said, fall victim to something that is insanely satanic and evil. And I can totally see how this new apostolic reformation movement, the dominionist, which is part of that, as well as that kundalini false Holy Spirit, I can see how all of these things clearly play right in to what is told us in scripture about the end times and the deception. We know that the false prophet will perform miracles, and it'll be claimed that this is the power of the Lord that is being used, but that will be the kundalini spirit. And wow, I'm just blown away by all the facts about all of this stuff to do with the NAR, the dominionism, and the kundalini spirit, and how it just lines up 100% with the end times scriptures. So pay attention. Again, share this video, pray about it, and open your eyes. For the past several decades, the political left has focused attention on the Christian rights political activism in America. Particularly, the left has been highly critical of a select group of dominionists called Reconstructionists, whose aggressive verbiage, extreme Calvinist theologies, and religious political agendas have made it an ideal target for outrage. But as leftist researcher Sarah Diamond has astutely observed, the Reconstructionist religion of Calvinism makes them unlikely to appeal to most evangelicals. Indeed, a few Reconstructionists would consider themselves to be evangelicals. Nevertheless, their influence has been considerable over the much larger group of patriotic evangelicals. There are two other dominionist sects within evangelicalism that have escaped in-depth scrutiny from the left. These dominionists have been able to function virtually incognito for several reasons. They have been deeply embedded within the evangelical subculture. They cloaked their dominionism with new terminologies and doctrines over a period of 30 years, and They figured out how to package dominionism using sophisticated mass marketing techniques. Also noteworthy, these two other dominionist camps have been operating in a dialectical fashion, while one group appealed to the TBN charismatics with all of its emotional excesses, the other group carefully managed its more intellectual public image to conform to traditional evangelical standards. This will be a brief overview of the three main dominionist movements operating inside evangelicaldom and examines how all three of these sects are now converging around a global kingdom agenda. 
This is not going to be a treatise on doctrine, nor is it a historical record, nor is it a thorough analysis of the multifarious streams of evangelical dominionism. This does not cover the broader issue of dominionist sects within other world religions, except for a few brief noteworthy mentions. To examine the totality of the individuals, the organizations, and their cross-linkages would require an exhaustive study which is beyond the scope of this brief synopsis. Even so, every point made could be validated by dozens, sometimes hundreds of pieces of documentation. There are footnotes and references beneath the article that I'm using to make this video, and I will provide the link if you would like to check those out. Only a small handful of Christian discernment and apologetic ministries, of which the author of this article being brought to you in this video is a part, have been paying attention to the intersection of the Dominionist streams. The apologetic ministries fulfill a scriptural role to examine and expose false doctrines and teachers and to warn other believers of heresies. You can find that in Jude 3 and 2 Peter 2.1. Increasingly, over the past two decades, many apologists have become seduced by dominionism, blunting their ability to critically examine the roots and fruits of this rapidly rising new church era. Throughout the 2,000-year history of Christianity, there has always been a vein of dominionism embedded in the strata of doctrines. This seam has ebbed and flowed for 20 centuries, sometimes submerged, sometimes exposed. Whenever out in the open, it has given rise to horrible abuses done in the name of Christ. In the early 21st century, once again, this vein is now showing and active. Keep in mind, dominionism is always an aberration of true Christian theology. A remnant of believers has always opposed it, often suffering a martyr's fate at the hands of intolerant dominionists. Traditional Christianity teaches the gospel of salvation is by faith in Jesus Christ and His shed blood on the cross. The emphasis is placed upon repentance and conversion of individual souls. The kingdom of God in this age is spiritual and grows through efforts of evangelism based on teaching the Bible. It is not of this world, John 18.36, but a spiritual rule in the hearts of men. Luke 17:20 20 through 21. Furthermore, the kingdom of God is only finally realized upon Christ's second return to earth, whereby he himself establishes his literal and physical reign. The evangelism mandate by word and spirit. Christ never intended that his gospel should be propagated by fire and sword, or his righteousness wrought by the wrath of man. When the high praises of God are in our mouth, with them we should have an olive branch of peace in our hands. Christ's victories are by the power of His gospel and grace over spiritual enemies, in which all believers are more than conquerors. The Word of God is the two-edged sword, Hebrews 4.12, the sword of the Spirit, Ephesians 6.17. However, dominionism teaches something deceptively different. Dominionism teaches the gospel of salvation is achieved by setting up the kingdom of God as a literal and physical kingdom to be advanced on earth in the present age. Some dominionists liken the New Testament kingdom to the Old Testament Israel in ways that justify taking up the sword or other methods of punitive judgment to war against enemies of their kingdom. Dominionists teach that men can be coerced or compelled to enter the kingdom. They assign to the church duties and rights that belong scripturally only to Jesus Christ. This includes the esoteric belief that believers can incarnate Christ and function as His body on earth to establish His kingdom rule, an inordinate emphasis is placed on man's efforts. The doctrine of the sovereignty of God is diminished. The New Dominion Mandate by Control Dominion theology is predicated upon three basic beliefs. Number one, Satan usurped man's dominion over the earth 
through the temptation of Adam and Eve. Number two, the church is God's instrument to take dominion back from Satan. And number three, Jesus cannot or will not return until the church has taken dominion by gaining control of the earth's governmental and social institutions. Dominion theology is a heresy. As such, it is rarely presented as openly as the definitions above may indicate. Outside of the Reconstructionist camp, evangelical dominionism has wrapped itself in slick packages one piece at a time for mass media consumption. This has been a slow process, taking several decades. Few evangelicals would recognize the word dominionism or know what it means. This is because other terminologies have been developed which soft-sell dominionism, concealing the full scope of the agenda. Many evangelicals, and even their more conservative counterparts, the fundamentalist, may adhere to tidbits of dominionism without recognizing the error. This is because, just as it is written in Jude 4, dominionism has crept in unawares to seduce an undiscerning generation. To most effectively propagate their agenda, dominionist leaders first developed new ecclesiologies, eschatologies, and soteriologies for targeted audiences along the major denominational fault lines of evangelical Christianity. Then, the 1990s Promise Keepers men's movement was used as a vehicle to break down the walls, also known as cross-denominational barriers, for the purpose of exporting dominionism to the wider evangelical subculture. This strategy was so effective that it reached into the mainline Protestant denominations. Dominionists have carefully selected leaders to be trained as change agents for transformation or dominion in an erudite manner that belies the media stereotype of Southern talking, Bible thumping, fundamentalist half-wits. Now, let's discuss the three sects of evangelical dominionism. There are three predominant sects or movements that propagate dominion theology, which hold considerable influence over evangelicaldom. Number one, spiritual warfare prayer movement. This movement teaches the kingdom of God must be advanced on earth through hyper-spiritual warfare activities against the devil, a veritable supermarket of verbal and physical prayer techniques, such as chanting, walks, and marches, are employed in this effort. Believers are told their prayer power creates spiritual canopies over regions, preparing the way for revival. In this sense, prayer warfare is seen as preparatory work so that the other two movements can build the kingdom. Recently, the contemplative prayer movement, which includes meditation, fasting, and labyrinths, has been brought into the spiritual warfare prayer arsenal. Prayer serves as a convenient decoy for covert operations. All three sects are utilizing massive statistical data banking resources, for example, the World Prayer Center in Colorado Springs, and sophisticated psychosocial group manipulations to forge kingdom transformation. One key leader of this sect is Cindy Jacobs, who is closely associated with C. Peter Wagner. Her website epitomizes the militant doctrines and practices of the spiritual warfare sect. Next, prayer before fighting. Our calling is to be worshipers, warriors, and workers. We must first offer our lives as a living sacrifice and worship to God. From our worship will flow our intercession and warfare as we fight with weapons of righteousness in our right hand and in our left. Only after we have worshipped our God and fought the fight in the Spirit will we proceed to work in the harvest fields, advancing the kingdom of God. Promoting these prayer warfare activities are hyper-charismatics from the Signs and Wonders movement, which include self-anointed, self-appointed apostles and prophets who are preparing to govern the world through their new apostolic reformation. 
This Dominionist sect is a direct offshoot of the latter rain cult, also known as Joel's Army or Manifest Sons of God. Chief architect of this movement for the past two decades is C. Peter Wagner, president of Global Harvest Ministries and chancellor of the Wagner Leadership Institute. His spiritual warfare teachings have been widely disseminated through mission networks, such as AD 2000, which was closely associated with the Lausanne movement. A prominent individual connected to this sect is Ted Haggard, current head of the National Association of Evangelicals. Next, the New Apostolic Reformation. I recently did a video covering the New Apostolic Reformation, but let's go ahead and give a brief summary in case you're not familiar. The following was written by C. Peter Wagner. Since 2001, the body of Christ has been in the Second Apostolic Age. The apostolic, prophetic government of the church is now in place. We began to build our base by locating and identifying with the intercessory prayer movements. This time, however, we feel that God wants us to start governmentally connecting with the apostles of the region. God has already raised up for us a key apostle in one of the strategic nations of the Middle East, and other apostles are already coming on board. Once we have the apostles in place, we will then bring the intercessors and the prophets into the inner circle, and we will end up with the spiritual core we need to move ahead for retaking the dominion that is rightfully ours. Again, that was written by C. Peter Wagner. The words revival, reformation, and transformation now carry embedded dominionist connotations. Fulfilling the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, no longer means spreading the gospel message by speaking the word of salvation from the Bible. The dominionist focus is placed upon the phrase making disciples with an incorrect exegesis that is disconcertingly compulsory. Traditional mission evangelism done one-on-one -on -one using the Bible is being replaced with a slew of kingdom-building corporate activities for cities, regions, and nations. The disingenuous phrase, bless the nations, is often used to conceal dominionism. Dr. Bill Bright of Campus Crusade for Christ International and Ralph Winter, founder of the U.S. Center for World Mission and editor of the Perspectives on the World Christian Movement Curriculum, which has taught dominionism to an entire generation of missionaries, have been among the chief architects of this movement. Dale Neal, the president of ICCC, stated, The church must grow past the gospel of salvation message and understand that it is only when we begin to implement the principles of the gospel of the kingdom that we will really begin to see change in lives and cities and nations. The church has no understanding of this realm. The church must grow up. Disciple the Nations stated, God's concern goes beyond the salvation of individual people. His redemptive plan encompasses the healing and transformation of entire nations. Nations are discipled as the church makes the invisible kingdom visible by faithful obedience to God's word throughout culture, in every area of life, and every realm of society, including the family and the community, the arts, science, media, law, government, schools, or businesses. So, where does the patriotic American movement fit into all of this? Patriotic dominionists, most of whom are not Reconstructionist, teach that political action will advance the kingdom of God in America. Using the vehicle of Christian media, they have taught evangelicals for the past three decades that America is a Christian nation and needs to return to its roots. Almost every evangelical in the pew has been influenced in one way or another by this sect. Patriotic Dominionist leaders and their organizations have been closely interlocked financially and politically with the conservatives from the political right. The secular conservatives purport to uphold morality which appeals to evangelicals. 
the combined force of conservatives and evangelicals flexes its political muscles in Washington, D.C. One of its most powerful leaders is James Dobson of Focus on the Family. Patriotic Dominionism was widely decimated through the activities of Jay Grimstead, founder of Coalition on Revival, or COR. From its earliest inception, COR managed to successfully bring together key leaders from all three Dominionist sects, including the Reconstructionist, to promote the most ruthless doctrines of Dominionism. Grimstead's COR Steering Council letter dated May 1993. The kingdom of God was inaugurated and the king was installed and seated in the first century A.D., and we need not wait for the king's second coming to get the kingdom started here on earth. Next, at this moment of history, all humans on earth, whether Jew or Gentile, believer or unbeliever, private person or public official, are obligated to bow their knees to this King Jesus, confess him as Lord of the universe with their tongues, and submit to his lordship over every aspect of their lives in thought, word, and deed. Next, biblical evangelism, according to the Great Commission of Matthew 28, 18 through 20, is not truly accomplished unless that message of Christ's lordship from the previous point is given to the person being evangelized so that they know that an attempt at personal neutrality before King Jesus is sin and treason in this universe. Dominionism goes global. Since the latter half of the 1990s, the three major dominionist sects have openly converged into an ecumenical force. These three branches of dominionism are linked historically at many levels, and there is a solid documentation to support the idea that the current convergence was planned and intentional. While leftists focus their attentions on political dominionists in American politics and what was going on in Iraq, the three movements went global. This new confederation of dominionists has been rapidly advancing its kingdom across the globe through economic, social, political, and spiritual transformation. To achieve this paradigm shift, the global dominionists have employed sophisticated psychosocial methodologies, statistical research, socioeconomic development tools, marketing research, strategic planning, assessments, data banking and monitoring, and technical assistance. They are also aggressively forming alliances with national and international governments, corporations, individuals, private agencies, philanthropic groups, and other entities. Here are some key examples of this rapid convergence around a global kingdom worldview. Global Spheres Observers from the left were infuriated when the Coalition on Revival Political Dominionist cranked out documents during the 1980s addressing a Christian worldview in 17 spheres of life and ministry, education, healthcare, and family, the arts, sciences, law, media, government, business, etc. This is because COR did not just write a philosophical statement, COR determined that it is mandatory for all Christians to implement that worldview in society, particularly as it applies to the Dominionist interpretation of the Great Commission. These fears did not disappear when COR began to fade off the radar screen. They have a new life. The worldview sphere documents have now gone global by becoming incorporated into mission agendas. Mission groups are now partnering with national and international governments, business corporations, NGOs, humanitarian entities, and others to build their kingdom in the cultural spheres of selected nations around the globe. Mission incorporates CORs. Spheres. The seven spheres of influence, or seven mountains of culture, as they are sometimes called, 
in which I'm about to describe to you are going to help us to shape these societies for Christ. God gave us these handles to use in carrying out Matthew 28 and discipling nations for him. We believe he is wanting all of his people to see the importance of these seven areas and work in them to extend Christ's reign throughout the earth. The family and healthcare, commerce, science and technology, the church, government, education, the media, the arts, entertainment, and sports. So I wanted to take a look at something real quick here. It just hit me, and I know there are many of you out there who believe that the great harlot is Rome and the Catholic Church. And you are partly correct, but it goes much deeper than that. And I'm going to prove it to you. But first, let's start with this verse. And this is the verse that many people who believe it's Rome and the Pope uphold. This is the one they use. It says, this calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. We can look at it in different translations, King James. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. New Living Translation. This calls for a mind with understanding. The seven heads of the beast represent the seven hills where the woman rules. They also represent seven kings. English Standard Version. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. Now, English Standard Version says mountains, Berean says mountains, uh, New American Standard says mountains. Now, New American Standard Bible, interestingly, is one of the most accurate based on word for word. You can look that up. King James Bible also uses mountains. The only one that uses hills here is the NIV, the Good News Translation, and there's probably more, but most translations agree on the word mountains. So now let's look at something else. Right here, this is the whole basis for the new apostolic reformation movement, as well as dominionists, which are part of the NAR. The false commission, the seven mountain mandate. This is the basis that they stand upon the kingdom of God. And they stand on the verse Isaiah 2, 2. Now it will come about that in the last days, the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains. That's what verse they use to uphold their seven mountain mandate. And it's arts and entertainment, business and finance, church, religion, dissemination, media, education, family, health, and government law. And their assignment for each one of these is to assimilate illuminate, demonstrate, and propagate in all of these seven areas called the seven mountains. Okay. Now we also know that the NAR has combined forces with the Catholic church and the Pope. I'll show you that in my uh, recent video with Kenneth Copeland and it, it shows him and the Pope talking and joining forces together to unify, to come together. Here you can see in this article, it is on Spirit of Error. I'm trying to find the date, June 25th of 2016. It says earlier this month on June 10th, leaders in the new apostolic reformation, NAR, including the International House of Prayer, the IHOP movement, whose founder is Mike Bickle, the apostle Shay on Harvest International Ministry, and prophets Chris Volatin, Bethel Redding and Stacy Campbell, Wes and Stacy Campbell Ministries attended a private meeting with the Pope along with dozens of other Protestant leaders from the North America and Europe. The NAR leaders' participation in the meeting is troubling for a number of reasons. Here are three. Now, also, as I just mentioned, Kenneth Copeland, that's a huge one. It says, first, the meeting shows that the Vatican is aware of the vast influence held by NAR apostles and prophets since in the Roman Catholic Church's efforts to reach out to Protestants, Vatican officials felt it necessary to include leaders in the new apostolic reformation. It also shows how mainstream the NAR movement has become despite its aberrant teachings. Now, as I just mentioned to you, Kenneth Copeland also was a huge part of that. In fact, you can see right here on his website, Kenneth Copeland Ministries, how to pray for the seven mountains of influence in America. And it goes through and shows each 
mountain, its title, and how to pray for it. But let me show you the whole thing with Kenneth Copeland and the Pope in case you're unaware of that. So you can see here in 2014, Pope Francis met Kenneth Copeland and James Robinson. And there's a video on that. So Kenneth Copeland and the Pope have joined forces. The entire NAR uh, people have done this. Now, interestingly, and I also mentioned this in this video is the fact that Donald Trump's religious cabinet, most, if not all, of his religious cabinet is made up of these NAR people, including Kenneth Copeland, Rabbi Schneider, Rick Joyner, Paula White, and more. So these are all NAR people, so that you know. So I want to go back to that verse that I just showed you. This calls for a mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. So for me, now we just saw that the Pope and these NAR leaders are joining forces. So yes, the Catholic Church and Rome is still part of this in a huge way. But for me, this harlot or the woman is this whole corrupt church, this whole NAR dominionist movement is the harlot who rides the beast. And these are the seven mountains that this verse is mentioning. Their seven mountain mandate. And then for the verses that says that they are also seven kings. For me, that could potentially represent the people who are appointed over each one of these mountains. So something interesting. So for those of you, like I said, that believe it's Rome and the papacy and the Pope, you are correct, but it's the combined forces of the papacy of Rome of the Pope with this whole dominionist NAR movement that wants to take over. They are going to bring in the Antichrist, this whole new world order system, and this one world religion that is already here, this whole coexist, Chrislam, and all that business. Like I said, it just hit me. And I'm sure there's probably other people who have figured this out too. I just haven't come across it. But it just hit me, the seven mountains in that Bible verse specifically talks about the seven mountains. I know there's people who think that it's a city, an actual city or a place. I just don't think so. I think that it's talking about this seven mountain mandate because these people are in our government. They are doing huge things. This NAR dominionist movement is the absolute biggest, fastest growing movement they have a ton of power. They are the most powerful. In fact, most evangelical Christians in this nation and in the world don't even know what they're involved in. They have no idea how wicked this is. And they're part of it and they don't even realize it. And that's why I'm doing this video. But I wanted to point this out. I'm going to add this into this video. This is huge. Just think about it and pray about it. I mean, we have literally the Christian Illuminati, so to speak, if there would be such a thing. It's not going to present itself in an obvious manner. It's going to be hidden and it's going to be deceptive. I mean, the Antichrist beast system isn't going to look like this or like this or like this, certainly not George Soros or our previous president, Barack Hussein Obama, it's going to look like this right here, like Jesus Christ. It's going to look friendly. It's going to look biblical. It's going to be something insanely deceptive that is going to fool even the best of us. It's not going to be something obviously evil. It's going to be something that has every appearance of looking good, wholesome, and biblical. And that's exactly what we're seeing 
with this whole NAR dominionist movement that is in our government and in our church and everywhere. So far, we've discussed dominionism in brief, as well as the three sects of evangelical dominionism, number one being spiritual warfare prayer movement, number two being mission as a transformation movement, and number three, the patriotic American movement. So now we're going to go ahead and focus on the seven mountains of culture or seven spheres of influence and give you some background on that. Many of you have heard or seen or may be familiar with the term disciple the nations. So let's dig into that and find out what all of that is about so you can really understand the evil and the wickedness and the deception involved in dominionism, which is part of this NAR movement, the New Apostolic Reformation movement. First on the list is the three-legged stool. The dominionist kingdom must be advanced on earth by gaining control over governments, state, utilizing business, corporations, and partnering with social sector, church, institutions. New bridges are being built based on triangular relationship between all three sectors of society. The church is forming partnerships or collaborations with state and or corporate interest, in order to implement dominion. Peter Drucker, the management guru, was instrumental in overseeing the implementation of this agenda to create a three-legged, healthy society globally, via Rick Warren of Purpose Driven Fame. Warren was mentored by Drucker, as were a number of other evangelical leaders, such as Bob Buford of Leadership Network. Buford trained an entire generation of aspiring megachurch pastors in Drucker's social philosophies. The megachurches are based on the Drucker corporate business model. Drucker's ideas also undergird the faith-based church-state movement, which has been politically championed by the neoconservatives in Washington, D.C. Dominionism is significantly breaking down the walls between church and corporations, In brief, the three-legged stool of dominionism looks like this. Corporate plus state equals fascism. State plus church equals faith-based. Church plus corporate equals fusion dash the merchant church. A quote from the Leadership Network clearly defines Drucker's three-legged stool model. The Peter F. Drucker Foundation for Nonprofit Management. Created 10 years ago to honor Peter Drucker's contributions to management and leadership, believes that a healthy society requires three vital sectors a public sector of effective governments, a private sector of effective businesses, and a social sector of effective community organizations, including faith based organizations. It furthers its mission to lead social sector organizations toward excellence in performance by providing educational opportunities and resources. Next is the phenomenon of Rick Warren. Rick Warren has single-handedly accomplished more to bring about a public convergence between the three sects of dominionism than any other individual. Warren received his doctorate from Fuller Theological Seminary under the tutelage of his advisor C. Peter Wagner of the Spiritual Warfare Dominionist. Dubbed America's pastor by the media, Warren has launched a grandiose plan to transform Africa to cure AIDS and poverty and fulfill the Great Commission. Warren transcends evangelicalism. He easily moves in internationalist circles, such as Aspen Institute, and aligns himself with rock stars like Bono from the band U2. Warren has audaciously called for a second reformation based on his global peace plan, which is a study in dominionism. Leftists who fret over Warren's foray into AIDS may miss the more serious dominionist ramifications of his overall global plan, Warren intends to amass the world's largest volunteer army of 1 billion foot soldiers to implement his global peace plan.
Plan. The Global Peace Plan to Make Disciples. In addition to its message of compassion, the Saddleback Church AIDS Conference sought to impart several other points emerging from Warren's Global Peace Plan. Based on the Great Commission to Make Disciples, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, and the Great Commandments to Love God and to Love Our Neighbors, Mark 12, 28 through 34, the plan is Warren's approach to attack what he calls the five global giants, spiritual emptiness, egocentric leadership, extreme poverty, pandemic diseases, and illiteracy and poor education by planting churches, equipping servant leaders, assisting the poor, caring for the sick, and educating the next generation. So far, can all of you who are listening to this see how deceptive this truly is? Because just to listen to it, what on earth could be wrong with it? It sounds great. Helping people, educating people, reaching out to people, assisting the poor, and equipping people. It all sounds so great. It sounds completely biblical, but it's not. And the more you listen, you're going to find out even more so than you have already why it's not and why it is a great, great deception. Not everything that looks good or sounds good is as it appears. Remember, the enemy Satan can appear as an angel of light, and he does all the time. Next, we're going to discuss marketplace ministries. Corporate business ventures are cloaking themselves in missionary garb to enter a nation and affect change, creating an outpost for new corporate markets in underdeveloped third world countries, particularly those rich in natural resources, is being done in the name of kingdom building. In order to establish a spiritual aura for these activities, a high-tech global day of prayer was established in May 2005 by the Spiritual Warfare Sect, working together with Rick Warren. This annual event is designed to promote the Dominionist agenda worldwide. Corporate marketplace ministry expansion is being done with claims of sustainable development, free trade, and other community development activities that could screen the Dominionist agenda. An influential marketplace mission organization is Transform World, which is one of the most patent examples of Dominionism. Mission groups are taking up the quest for corporate expansion and financial gain by linking with business corporations who are taking up the mission to expand their markets in the name of kingdom building. Meanwhile, C. Peter Wagner has cooked up a new definition of ecclesia, or better known in Greek as the church, to fuse the church with the corporate workplace. Marketplace dominionism. What is required is a change of heart. The heart of the nation is the marketplace. The combination of business, education, and government, the three arteries through which its life flows. If we take God's power and presence to the marketplace, we will indeed see nations changed. To change a man, you must first change his heart. This approach, of course, is typical of missionary organizations. Silvoso's idea, though, is far more radical. Cities can be changed in nature. Countries can be redeemed. Entire cultures can be brought to salvation. The land itself, in fact, can be healed. And such a miraculous change is brought about through one primary avenue, God working through the marketplace. A quote From an interview in Business Reform with Ed Silvaso of Harvest Evangelism states, The primary means to true revival, though, takes place first in the marketplace. The Business Mission Company To achieve its purpose, the Business Mission Company must develop and invest in Great Commission efforts that are synergistic with and leveraged by the company's presence in strategically selected markets. It must set standards for evangelism and discipleship, measure results, 
and evaluate results per dollar invested for every sphere of influence identified in the market analysis. Company spheres of influence and the spheres of influence of each team member are specific market segments targeted for impact. Any parts of the company that do not produce to standards are pruned. An axe is laid to the root of those that do not produce at all. And that was a quote from John Cregan on Kingdom Business, transforming missions through entrepreneurial strategy. Next, militant rhetoric. There is a notable increase in the stridency and urgency of strategic level prayer warfare rhetoric, which is linked to global transformation or dominionism. False prophets regularly pump out new prophecies and decrees to shore up the kingdom mandate. These prophecies function like oracles. They are a major avenue for communicating God's plan for the next step in kingdom building. False apostles have been anointed, appointed as leaders of regions around the globe, and charged with wielding the king's authority. The doctrines of the new apostolic reformation have been promulgated throughout the mission movement by C. Peter Wagner, Cindy Jacobs, Chuck Pierce, Bill Hammond, a group known as the Kansas City Prophets, the Vineyard Fellowship, and many more. At the highest echelons, these organizations all have interlocking boards of directors. Two noteworthy internal organs for disseminating false prophecies and new doctrines include the Elijah List and Joel News. A Militant False Prophecy Rick Joyner stated in a piece titled Taking the Land that we are coming to the times when Passive Christianity and passive Christians will cease to exist. There is a maturity, a discipline, and a divine militancy coming upon the people of God. Those who have succumbed to humanistic and idealistic theologies may have a hard time with this, but we must understand that God is a military God. The title that he uses ten times more than any other scripture in scripture is the Lord of hosts, or Lord of armies. There is a martial aspect to his character that we must understand and embrace for the times and the job to which we are now coming. Next, neo-evangelical and neo-conservative allies. The December 2005 issue of Mother Jones magazine was devoted to examining the patriotic dominionist, it included an article about the National Christian Foundation, a philanthropic group linked to neoconservative organizations. This brief article called attention to a vast network of interlocking boards of directors and financial ties between neoconservatives and neo-evangelicals. The website www.mediatransparency.org explores patriotic dominionist financial ties to neoconservative groups, but it does not delve into the considerable linkages between the other two sects and the neoconservatives. Some of the bonds between these individuals and organizations go back over half a century, and some connections are alarmingly anti-Semitic. Corporate acts of charity, especially through the influence of the philanthropic groups, are supplanting the traditional doctrine of let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, Matthew 6.3. Marketplace transformation is also forging many new political alliances. Dennis Peacock of COR is an influential marketplace transformation leader who is also a member of the International Coalition of Apostles, the Spiritual Warfare Dominionist. Peacock, who easily moves in all three sects, has suggested changing global economic structures. The new apostles move into governments. Apostle Jim Hodges took the stage on a Wednesday evening to introduce an exciting new venture for FMCI, a permanent presence in Washington, D.C., called the International Leadership Embassy, or ILE. 
The ILE positions FMCI more directly to affect our government, our nation, and world nations by establishing contacts with government officials, D.C. citizens, and international diplomats. The ILE will further facilitate on-site intercession efforts in Washington, D.C., host visiting prayer teams, sponsor kingdom-oriented teachings for government officials, employees, and interns, and Christian leaders. And we can see that today in the White House. We have Donald Trump, who has a pretty decent-sized cabinet of these NAR leaders, including Kenneth Copeland. Next, whose kingdom come? There has been a significant rise of cross-pollination between evangelical dominionist and New Age theosophist. Since the late 1970s, there has been a closeted fraternization between dominionist and theosophist for the purpose of finding common ground for the future. Both groups seek to bring in a Christ figure to solve the world's problems. Both groups have grand utopian plans to create peace on earth. During the past decade, the two groups began borrowing doctrinal terminologies from one another and working on common theologies. The events of 9-11 gave a new impetus to this effort. J. Gary, who has been a leader within all three sects of Dominionism, has had close ties with the Theosophist and is adopting new theologies, including a hybrid of preterism called transmillennialism. Bob Buford of Leadership Network, mentioned previously, has been working since the mid-1990s to create a youth culture based on emergent theologies called the Emergent Church a mixture of New Age paganism, Eastern mysticism, and evangelical dominionism. And patriotic dominionist leaders have long-standing close ties with the Reverend Sun Myung Moon, who has his own messianic kingdom ambitions. Christ's Law The crime of separation, of division, of lawlessness must go from the world. All that hinders the manifestation of man's divinity must be driven from our planet. My law will take the place of separation. And that was from Maitreya the Christ. Next, the stewardship deception. The transformational covenant by Lewis Bush is a key document which outlines the new theology of stewardship dominion. Bush has held very influential positions in the mission movement as a leader in AD 2000, World Inquiry, and the Lausanne Committee for World Evangelization. He now serves as the international facilitator of Transform World. By linking a reinterpreted Genesis 1 stewardship of the earth mandate to the reinterpreted Great Commission doctrine, there is a volatile new doctrine of dominionism doctrine rising. This stewardship mandate was actually first proposed as a deceptive strategy in the late 1970s by Jeremy Rifkin in his book, The Emerging Order. Rick Warren and others have now picked up the theme. George Otis of the Sentinel Group, spiritual warfare dominionist, suggests that by taking dominion of the earth, he calls it transformation, Paradise can be restored as in Genesis 1 before the fall, an old latter rain cult heresy that presents an alternative eschatology of dominion, cultivating the Great Commission ecosphere. EFMA exists to cultivate the Great Commission ecosphere so that it bears good and abundant fruit and God is glorified among all people. To this end, the fellowship works in depth with members to enhance mutual effectiveness and increase capacity as we work to extend Christ's kingdom. EFMA works broadly within the mission community who share a commitment to Christ, the scriptures, and obedience to God's command to disciple the nations. Here is a quote from the International Christian Chamber of Commerce. Evangelical Fellowship of Mission Agencies, the Genesis 1 Stewardship Mandate. When God created man, he gave man dominion over the earth. 
Adam relinquished man's dominion by disobedience. Redemption and restoration of man's dominion over the earth, as well as his reconciliation with God, was made possible by Jesus. Again, that was a quote from the International Christian Chamber of Commerce. Next, leftist dominionist. Evangelical leftist, like Tom Sign, Ron Sider, Jim Wallace, and others, have always hobnobbed with the dominionist. Many of the key leftist dominionists have been coalescing around an agenda to eradicate world poverty, laboring with Rick Warren to implement the United Nations Millennium Development Goals. MICA Challenge is one of the key organizations operating in this realm. A number of international mission networking agencies have formed alliances around these mutual kingdom aspirations. Working to end poverty may seem laudable on the surface, but scratch the surface and dominionism appears. Charity is not what it seems. Charity is a vehicle to maneuver dominionism into the best possible international publicity spotlight. And altruistic appeals for charitable sacrifice are a mechanism to sign up recruits in the Billion Man Army. WEA, Micah Challenge, and Wolfowitz. The church is God's primary instrument of transformation within the local community, says Tunicliffe, chair of Micah Challenge Canada and international director of the World Evangelical Alliance, or WEA. Canadian churches and Christian organizations must evaluate what they are doing to serve the poor. They must keep themselves informed about issues surrounding poverty and strive to find meaningful, practical outlets for people to respond. While in Washington, the group also met with the new president of the World Bank, Paul Wolfowitz, who reportedly told the Christian leaders that the church could become a more significant player in the role of responding to global poverty. The World Bank, a source of financial and technical assistance to developing countries around the world, has traditionally worked with governments. But, Tunicliffe says, they want to evaluate the possible role that could be played by the faith-based community in such work. A small body has been set up by the faith-based community to advise the World Bank in setting policy. The WEA has been asked to participate. Next, we're going to discuss the militant church. Since 9-11, patriotic fervor has combined with the neoconservative goals, and there is a disturbing rise of actual military activity for kingdom-building purposes. This activity is especially alarming because it encompasses all three major Dominionist sects. Dominionist cult leader Bill Gothard has set up paramilitary training camps for evangelical children. Christian right leader Michael Ferris, connected with Coalition on Revival, is recruiting homeschoolers for CIA-type training at his Patrick Henry College. One can see how the Army is recruiting homeschoolers, many of whom are active in the patriotic Dominionist sect. Campus Crusade, an international mission organization, asks for prayer that we will accomplish our military ministry goal to change continents for Christ. Dr. Hope Taylor, Ministry Director of International Leadership Embassy in Washington, D.C., recently wrote, The Church has the mantle to execute the will of the King concerning the war in Iraq and the war on terrorism. This assignment must not be abrogated or left solely to the military. Dr. Richard Kirby of the World Network for Religious Futurists, a hybrid of neo-evangelicals and theosophists, has written, We want to train up a school of prophets who will be able to listen to the fresh word of God and deliver it to the people. Perhaps one example of this is the work of the religious futurist group with the military and with NASA, the Space Authority. The Shepherd's Rod, False Prophecy. From this picture, we will be strengthened as a mighty warrior and equipped to encounter the plots of the adversary set against this generation. The Lord is a warrior, and we are to be clothed in His militant attributes 
as it relates to the enemy who dwells in heavenly places. There will be times and seasons to hide ourselves in Christ, and other times to be aggressive and militant in our posture. The seasons that we isolate ourselves with Christ is not for dormancy, but to wait upon Him and minister to Him to gain His insight and blueprint for victory. There will be a marked escalation in the angelic activities surrounding the church. Furthermore, this activity will carry a militant characteristic as Michael and the warring angels of heaven are released to establish the design of heaven in the earth. As in the days of Israel, the giants of the adversary are occupying the land of promise and must be displaced in order to access our inheritance. To experience the governmental release related to the dominion associated with his kingdom design, we must also allow the Holy Spirit to equip us as overcomers clothed in garments of righteousness. Emerging Global Ethics Fulfilling the kingdom mandate is seen as so critical that the end justifies the means. Rick Warren has advocated for a philosophy of do whatever it takes to achieve his global peace plan. Putting forth the global hunger and AIDS crisis as a rationale to further the Dominion Kingdom has proven to be a brilliant strategy. The new gospel of pragmatism, combined with emotive pleas for compassion, is superseding any ethical or doctrinal concerns about the legitimacy of the emerging church-state-corporate partnerships. Pragmatic Priorities Eradicating global poverty for all is a key priority for Christians, but specific attention also needs to be paid to the scandal of inequality and deprivation within the worldwide Christian community, says Mennonite World Conference, MWC, Executive Secretary Larry Miller. Mr. Miller, writing in the latest issue of Courier, a multilingual MWC publication, supports the agape call of the World Council of Churches and the Micah Challenge of the World Evangelical Alliance, stating the biblical and theological case for involvement in the UN Millennium Development Goals to have world poverty by 2015, and that's have, H-A-L-V-E. What must be added to those calls and cried out loudly is a plea to overcome the disaster of poverty in the church, he adds. Evangelicals have traditionally adhered to the gospel directive to function as salt, Matthew 5.13, and light, Matthew 5.14, in the world. This scripture was not traditionally laden with dominionist connotations. What it means is that Christians, by their individual or church-based acts of compassion, can make a difference in the lives of people. And by a holy and righteous lifestyle that matches a biblical profession of faith, Christians can make a positive difference within their culture. Being salt and light also means that there is a duty to do good in the face of evil. Romans 16.19 the scripture speaks of a type of separation between church and state that forbids unholy coalitions. When a financial church-state question was posed by the chief priests and scribes to the Lord Jesus Christ, he answered, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which be Caesar's, and unto God the things that be God's. Luke 20.25 while believers have a responsibility to obey the laws and rulers of the land, Romans 13, they are also required to obey God rather than man, Acts 5.29, especially when the truth of the gospel message is at stake. By engaging in this vast new dominionist alliance, the Christian witness has been compromised the ability to function independently as directly accountable to God while adhering to biblical truth alone has been sharply curtailed. The biblical charge to boldly speak the truth, Philippians 1.14 and 1 Thessalonians 2.2, has been subrogated to the never-speak-critically mantras of the Rick Warren's purpose-driven church covenants. 
The Dominionist corroborations effectually function as a conspiracy against scriptural truth. Jeremiah 11, 9 through 10, and Ezekiel 22, 25 through 30. What about the old doctrine, the truth, that is so hard to find in this day, versus this heresy, this different gospel that is being preached all over the place? Reverend Charles Spurgeon, back in the 1880s, stated, The kingdom of Christ is not a kingdom of this world. Otherwise, would his servants fight? It rests on a spiritual basis and is to be advanced by spiritual means. Yet Christ's servants gradually slipped down into the notion that his kingdom was of this world and could be upheld by human power, making merchandise. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, and through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you. 2 Peter 2, 1a and 3a. The Merchant Church. This kingdom being built is not of Jesus Christ of the Bible. It is not for the Jesus of the Bible. It has nothing to do with him, but everything to do with an antichrist zeitgeist that is frightening, appalling, and massive in its buildup. At the present time, it is still possible for seekers after truth to access the old doctrines and old sermons and books and on the internet. The time has nearly come when these traditional gospel doctrines will be declared heretical and a threat to the false king and kingdom that are being set up. The Bible speaks of a latter-day heresy called Mystery Babylon, which is a merger of commerce and church. This unholy dominionist mixture A modern-day alchemy is what appears to be forming before our very eyes. The Global Merchants And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the Great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, And the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise any more. The merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and of pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and all thine wood, and all manner vessels of ivory, and all manner vessels of most precious wood, and of brass, and iron, and marble, and cinnamon, and odors, and ointments, and frankincense, and wine, and oil, and fine flour, and wheat, and beasts, and sheep, and horses, and chariots, and slaves, and the souls of men." Revelation 18, 2 through 3, and 11 through 13. In case you're still just a little bit confused, let's take a look at the top 10 reasons to reject this new world view of dominionism. It says the doctrines of dominionism are rooted in the earth. Their basis is the false teaching that man must take dominion of this earth and change it for the better before Jesus can come. The emphasis, therefore, has shifted from looking up to looking around to see what can be done to patch up the environment and change society into a more godly one. This scheme is unscriptural and should be rejected as heresy. Following are 10 reasons why. Reason number one, it requires a universal kingdom of God and earth. Obviously, in order to alter society and bring in biblical laws for the nations, in order to change man's habits of greed and violence, there would have to be a world government headed and policed by Restoration Christians. The Holy Roman Religio-Political Empire nearly achieved this in time gone by, but at a high cost. 
the oppression of the masses, wide scale poverty, and ignorance, the disappearance of the Bible text in the common language, papal abuses, priestly dominion, and the slaughter of thousands of dissenters and so called heretics who refused to bow the knee to Roman dictators in the church. Now, let's pause there just to reflect on something. The Antichrist is going to demand that everyone worship him. He will have his own religious system based upon who he is and what he is and what will happen when people refuse to bow to him, when people refuse to take the mark of the beast. So I think you get my point there. This system requires obedience to law. If any system of religion is going to be introduced worldwide amongst many who offer only a token submission to it, obviously that religion must be strongly enforced and governed by rules and regulations. In fact, the religion proposed by Dominionism and other Christian movements for world transformation today is one closely modeled on the Old Testament law. Every part of the world system law, government, medicine, education, etc., would be ruled by biblical precepts. But the New Testament demonstrates that law cannot save mankind and that the only hope for man is in justification by faith. The law has failed to transform mankind, and it always will, Romans 7, 6. But dominionism adherents hope to resurrect it as the basis of a new age of peace and righteousness. Now, I want to make it clear we're not talking about the whole seeker-friendly gospel message that is being preached. That's another problem in itself. We're talking about dominionist. Taking restoration teachings to their logical conclusion, it is clear that nothing less than world Christianization would work the miracle of planetary salvation. This, say the leaders, would be the kingdom of peace and righteousness promised in the Old Testament. However, given the condition of the human heart and Satan's plans for world dominion, it is actually the universal reign of terror through Antichrist. In the word of God, not universal obedience, but universal wickedness is forecast before the coming of Christ, and all nations will follow the satanic plans of the beast, Revelation 13, verses 3 and 4. To set about organizing and networking for a new order and for global dominion is to throw huge parts of the church into the hands of another Christ and another gospel. Reason number two, it robs the Jews of their inheritance. In order to provide biblical proof of their role as earth saviors and lawgivers, and in order to support their claim to be the kingdom of God on earth, dominionism leaders have to pirate the Old Testament promises of God to the nation of Israel and make them apply to the church. They have gone on record as saying that Israel has no further place in God's future plan for blessing the nations, nor will the kingdom promises of the Old Testament come to pass specifically for Israel, but only by and through the church. The Jews rejected their Messiah, they say, and so forfeited their inheritance. But God, who can never lie nor break his word, has promised specific material blessings of land, prosperity, nationhood, peace, and victory to the literal nation of Israel in the future. These promises have never been fulfilled and can only be fulfilled in the context of a regathering and spiritual resurrection of Jews in the literal land of Israel, Jeremiah 31, 35 through 37, with ultimate fulfillment in the millennial kingdom after Christ's second coming. Reason number three, it removes awareness of the return of the Lord. The emphasis on earthly triumph for the church and long years of victorious rule to precede the Lord's coming removes the need to watch and pray and be ready for that day. Many sensitive Christians are aware that the signs leading up to the second coming of the Lord Jesus are being fulfilled in this generation and that, in fact, the coming may be very soon indeed. If so, we ought to be on our guard against laxity and deception, as Jesus warned. But restoration doctrine promises ultimate triumph for the church instead of the tribulation of the end times prophesied in the word, and so encourages a careless attitude. 
Reason number four, it denies the scriptural prophecies of the end times. Because dominionism teaching places the binding of evil and the dominion of righteous at the first coming of the Lord, it radically adjusts our understanding of the book of Revelation and the other prophecies of the end. According to this scheme, the tribulation, antichrist, apostasy, and so forth are placed historically in the past or else are made out to be symbolic interpretations of ordinary antagonism against the victorious church. The restoration understanding of prophecy is largely post-millennial. That is, it places the return of Christ after the reign of righteousness and peace. Therefore, what is now expected is not tribulation but triumph. This is very dangerous, especially as the scripture warns that before Jesus returns, a world leader claiming to be Messiah will arise. That can be found in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. It may be that dominionists, unaware of the true prophetic calendar, will accept this man as Christ. And that's something interesting to think about. They may very well believe that the Antichrist is the true Christ. Remember, there will be great deception. So that's a great possibility since they have their belief kind of mixed up there, I'd say. Reason number five, it denies the sovereignty of the Godhead. Dominionism doctrine claims that Jesus cannot return until all of his enemies have been put under the feet of the church, including death, presumably. His coming is not at the appointed time ordained by God, as scripture says in Acts 1-7, but must wait on the preparations made for him by the church, for the world must be evangelized and saved and the bride must be totally united and without spot or wrinkle when he comes. However, the Bible states that very few will be ready when Jesus comes and that the purification of the bride is a work of the Holy Spirit, not Christian leaders. Luke 18.8 8 and Matthew 7.14. Reason number six to reject this heresy, it requires religious unity. Since the world must be evangelized and cleaned according to this doctrine, and since this cannot be done by individual churches, it is imperative that all denominations, now including Mormons, come together to do the work. The plan for the world evangelism entails an overthrowing of doctrinal differences, such as justification by faith alone, to allow Roman Catholics and liberals to help Christianize the world. Now, if you noticed, for example, in a recent video of mine, and I'm sure many of you saw elsewhere too, where Kenneth Copeland had the Pope on video and they were agreeing to work together for the faith and so forth, uniting together. But the scripture forbids us to work together with unbelievers and heretics. And if you doubt that, you can find it in 2 Corinthians 6.14. Reason number seven, it rests on human ability and wisdom. Instead of the wisdom and power of the Holy Spirit, the scheme of world restoration calls for the development of man's social skills and knowledge, organizational ability, qualities of leadership, rhetoric, and the ability to dominate adversaries. Dominionists are now being encouraged to take a full part in in all areas of the world system in order to change it from within. This is what the transformation movement is all about. With marketplace apostles and marketplace Christians, for instance. But Bible Christians were often the poorest and least intelligent and relied on nothing but the power of God to back their preaching. Their work was to preach the gospel only and never were Christians told in scripture to change mankind by social action. 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5. Reason number eight, it requires a structured church system based on human leadership. In order to establish world dominion, dominionism teaching must be unvaried and universal, and this cannot be done without the obedience of all of its followers. Thus, a system of leadership or discipleship must be introduced to ensure every Christian is under authority and unable to err from the teaching. This leadership model is the new apostolic reformation headed by the International Coalition of Apostles 
Under head horizontal apostle, see Peter Wagner. This excludes from the one world religion all those who disagree with dominionism teaching. In effect, it disinherits all other Christians from the body of Christ. Indeed, some dominionist fellowship teach that their church is the only valid one, that the door to salvation is through the church, not Jesus Christ the Savior, and that everyone outside of the system is outside of the kingdom of God. Reason number nine, it replaces Jesus with the church. In an effort to strengthen the claims of the church on earth as a kingdom and authority to be obeyed, Dominionism doctrine has come close to replacing the Lord Jesus with his body. Now, you know that Jesus and the body are two separate entities, but Dominionists come awfully close to replacing Jesus with the body. The properties, abilities, and authority of Jesus are made over to the visible body on earth, and his functions as head and government Shepherd and king are taken over by apostles on his behalf, they say. Then it becomes the responsibility of the church to destroy the wicked and establish the kingdom on earth. This is exactly what word, faith, and latter reign new apostolic heretics have been teaching for years. Yet this leads to human arrogance and rivalry and replaces obedience to God with submission to the church. And finally, reason number 10, it draws from corrupt roots. What we know today as dominionism doctrine is a hybrid of Roman restorationism, dominionism, preterism, liberal amillennialism, postmillennial eschatology, and latter rain doctrines. The latter rain revivals of the early 20th century introduced an ideal new to Christendom, that of achieving religious unity and a golden age for the church by means of revelation knowledge and spiritual power. Much more was entailed in the scheme, but this heresy, though largely debunked in the 1950s, seeded the charismatic movement and linked with other groups to form the restoration movement, latter rain, etc. Thus, much current heresy on the birth of the man-child and the role of an elite army of saints in taking the nations for God, which came to our present time in the Toronto Blessing, Brownsville, Benny Hinn, Kenneth Copeland, and a host of false apostles and prophets on TV, has been able to implant itself most readily in charismatic churches where restoration teachings had already paved the way. Many have discovered from bitter experience in Dominionism fellowships that behind the smiling faces, camaraderie, loving embraces, and victorious praise, there lies a spirit of dominion that will wound and crush any who do not toe the line. An empire-building, self-seeking arrogance pervades much of the dominionism leadership, and they have proven themselves closed to correction. Greed, corruption, immorality, and spiritual abuses have thrived in this climate, and the teaching which focuses so much on the earth as our inheritance had led many to become so in love with this present world as to adopt almost all of its values. Without denying that there are many sincere people who claim to be Christians within this system, it needs to be said most strongly that dominionism churches are a foundation of sand, and the doctrines taught are unscriptural, unsound, and finally heretical, where they deny the bodily return of Jesus Christ to earth to rule and to judge. So, in conclusion, anyone with the dominionism system should think very carefully about the dangers to their spiritual walk. Dominionism is heresy, and the Bible is clear that we are to reject heresy and heretics. Titus 3.10 Mark and avoid false teachers, Romans 16, 17, and prove that we love the Lord by obeying his commands, John 5, 10. Our mandate is the same as when Christ ascended until he returns. Preach the gospel, Mark 16, 15, and disciple believers from all the nations, Matthew 28, 19. We are not to overthrow the governments of the world, take our businesses, or throw our collective Christian weight around in a bid to take over everything. 
We are to be light and salt, Matthew 5, 13 through 15, to a dying world, 1 Corinthians 7, 31, and abide until he comes, 1 John 2, 28. Christians need to get busy witnessing for Christ and drop this dominionist kingdom building rhetoric and planning because if they do not, they will be playing right into the hands of the coming Antichrist. Now, let's take a look real quick, and I'm just going to show you what the article says, okay? There may be names on here I'm not familiar with or don't know. You can research these people. I'm showing it to you to give you that option. I'm not going to accuse. Just going to show you what is said here. It says, uh, who's teaching it? Chuck Colson, Prison Fellowship, and it's got some notes under there you can look at. Gary North, Christian Reconstructionist, Reformed Theology. Rick Joyner, Kansas City Prophets, Latter-day Rain, NAR. Earl Polk, Manifest Sons of God, Dominionist, recently involved in a sex scandal. I don't know when this article was written. Tommy Tenney, former UPC, Anti-Trinitarian, NAR. Vincent Sinan, or Sinan, Reconstructionist, Reformed. Fred Price, Word Faith. Ern Baxter, Associate of William Branham, a Latter Rain founder. Bill Hammond, Latter Rain Prophetic Movement, NAR. Francis Frangipane, Latter Rain Associate of Rick Joyner, NAR. And that could be pronounced Frangipane, I'm not sure. Kenneth Hagen, Word Faith, Deceased. C. Peter Wagner, Head Apostle of the NAR. Uh, Jim Lafoon, Apostle of the NAR. So there's some names there. Now, I'm not for certain, but I know that Kenneth Copeland is a huge NAR leader. I'm aware of that as well as some others. I'm not sure if Kenneth Copeland is a dominionist, though. So we have NAR, the New Apostolic Restoration Movement, as an umbrella term. And then below that, you have different sects of it. Now, some of those different sects of it, such as dominionism, do have slight differences or different activities in their uh, in their body, you know, being the new apostolic restoration movement. Now, most people who are part of the NAR do not call themselves that, and most people who are dominionists don't even use that term. So you have to really know what to look for. There is somebody, and I can't remember his name. If I said it right now, you would probably know who specifically tells people that he is part of the NAR, and some do. This is definitely something to research, and I can totally see how deceptive it is. I'm sure you can see that too, and I can totally see how this plays right into the one world religion and the antichrist system. And that is a very good question that this author posed about these dominionists possibly being deceived into thinking the Antichrist is the Messiah because they kind of have their beliefs backwards. So they could potentially believe that. And it's, I don't know, all I know is the Bible tells us there is great deception. We know we are in the end times, but we have these dominionists, which make up the majority of, of all your Christian leadership here in the West we have them basically saying there's just going to be revival, that these tribulation things aren't happening, the kingdom will be established on this earth, and everything that is opposite of what the Bible tells us is going on. So this kind of clarified some things and put it in more perspective, so I wanted to show it to you. If there is any doubt in your mind that the NAR, the New Apostolic Reformation Movement, and one of the sects of NAR, which is called Dominionism, is not evil. I urge you to watch this video again. It is very evil, and it is the very thing that I believe is, as the Bible describes, as the one world religion, ushering in the new world order and the Antichrist. Very evil, very satanic. The sad thing is, I would say the vast majority of Christians in the United States of America and abroad are part of this NAR movement, and they don't even know it. And what I mean by part of it is I mean you're sitting under a pastor who's part of it, or you're listening to teachers and preachers and evangelists on TV 
who are part of it. And it sounds so moving and so good. It sounds so Holy Spirit filled. And in fact, after you watch a message by these people, you have this overall spirit of empowerment. Like you can go take on the mountains. And I understand that because I too have felt that. But my friends, it is a deceptive spirit. And the Bible warns us about end times deception, even so much that the elect would be led astray if the days were not shortened. So you must understand, I know many of you are probably offended or you just think it's a bunch of nonsense. Maybe you heard the name of someone that you follow. I did receive a lot of unpleasant emails when I put out the NAR video because there were some people and musicians and things that were part of some of the movements I named, maybe even some of the people that were named in the article I shared, and people were extremely offended. But we must remember, we serve God, we don't serve these people. And if someone is out there and they're delivering an apostate message or heresy, we have to point it out. And we have to be aware, and we have to open our eyes, and we have to love God the most, and we have to be believers in Him and trust in Him, and we have to be knowledgeable of what His Word says. That is so important. It's always important, but never has there been a time where it is very important as it is now. We are in the end times. There is a lot of soul-killing deceptive things being preached. And as I just said, sadly, many people are taken by it. They don't know. It's their favorite pastor or teacher, and they just don't even want to open their minds to the fact that the very preacher or teacher they have been following and listening to could be part of something this evil. Now, I will say this, and I don't know. I really don't. I could be wrong. But I guarantee there are some well-known pastors out there or teachers who really don't understand that what they're part of is heresy or that it is evil. I guarantee there's some that their eyes are closed to it. They really believe they're part of some really fiery Holy Spirit end times, revival type uh, teaching. So I think there are some pastors and teachers that are part of it who themselves are deceived, but they're still going to be accountable because we all have access to the truth. And just like you and I are going to be accountable if we allow ourselves to be led astray by such heresy when we do have access to the truth. I'm sure there's big guys at the top that know what it's all about and they're in it for the money. But as you trickle down further into the system, you know, further down the line, I am sure that many of these people preaching it and teaching it are also bought into it and they don't understand what they're part of because they just didn't pick up on the deception for some reason. Their hearts are hardened. I don't really know. So I don't think everyone that is part of these movements is really aware of how evil it is. They are deceived by this end times deceiving spirit. So I wanted to bring this to your attention. I hope you enjoyed the information, and I hope that you will remain faithful and prayerful to the Lord at all times and search the scriptures. That is so important. The Lord has really laid that on my heart. So many people are taking YouTubers, even like myself, taking their word for it or taking some pastor's word for it on TV or some person they come across somewhere on the internet, even your local hometown church pastor. I mean, we shouldn't take anybody's word for anything. We need to really dig into the Bible and see what God's word has to say. Otherwise, if we fail to do this, we are going to be so easily led astray. Now, I also want to encourage you Before you search the scriptures for anything, just bow your head and say a quick prayer. Ask the Lord to open your eyes. Ask Him for direction. 
and understanding and also pray against any demonic powers that would try to interfere or interrupt with your time with the Lord, because that's a big thing the enemy does. Either makes you tired suddenly, you have this like horrible, heavy tiredness come on you, or you start getting distracted with phone calls, texts, people at the door, you start thinking about things, your mind starts wandering. It's always something. So stay focused. I also wanted to say, if the Lord moves you to give a financial gift to the Lindley Oz ministry, your help is greatly appreciated. I am fully 100% viewer supported, so I can only continue bringing you the truth if people are helping to support me financially to do this. So I do have a business PayPal and a PO box if you prefer to send check or money order. You can do it that way. The information will be posted below the screen. And you know what? God loves a cheerful giver. So I in no ways want anyone to feel obligated. You do what the Lord leads you to do. I just want to make it known in case you did not know or to remind you that I'm 100% viewer supported and I do uh, have to have gifts to be able to continue doing this. So don't be guilted into it. If you can only pray, then please pray. That's awesome because I know we get so busy It's a real sacrifice to spend time praying for other people, and I know this, so your prayers are appreciated. To those of you who have been giving, I just want to say thank you, and thank you to those of you who send me the sweetest letters in the mail and cards. I read every one of them. I don't get to respond to all of them. That's very hard for me because sometimes I do get a lot of little letters and cards, but I just want you to know I appreciate it. Your letters and beautiful cards bless me and touch me. Thank you so much. God bless you. And please share this video to help it circulate. I am shadow banned by YouTube and blacklisted. So get the word out by sharing the videos, like the videos that also helps. And just keep looking up because our redemption draws nearer and nearer every day. God bless all of you.